All right, so the blood sugar is high and we're having symptoms. So that's symptomatic hyperglycemia. And then this may, patient may be uh, having an altered mental status. They might have some other problems. So again, we're looking at some difference here. In type 1 diabetes, this could ultimately lead to ketoacidosis with dehydration from excessive urination. In type 2 diabetes, it can lead to non-ketotic hyperosmolar state of dehydration. So we're going to look at some of these differences here. So with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome, which is HHNS, this is coming from blood glucose levels that are not controlled. So um, not just one day, but again, long term, this has been uncontrolled in type 2 diabetes. So some things we're going to see here, high blood sugar, altered mental status, severe dehydration. So we can look at this with uh, poor skin turgor, pinching that skin up on the hand and seeing it not return to normal within, you know, about two seconds or so. Increased thirst, dark urine, visual changes, muscle weakness. These higher glucose levels in the blood cause excretion of glucose over into the urine. The patient in turn will uh, increase their fluid intake. They can't drink enough fluid to keep up with the exceedingly high glucose levels in the blood. Their urine becomes dark and concentrated and they may be unconscious or have seizure activity due to that severe dehydration. So again, this is not something that's going to occur overnight. This is something that takes days and weeks just like the DKA did and it's definitely something to be concerned about. So we want to make sure that if we have patients who are known diabetics type 1 or type 2 that we are constantly monitoring to make sure that they are following up with their treatment and that's where things like the community paramedic program are coming into play where they're following up with patients to make sure they're compliant with medications that they're compliant with their diet and exercise uh, regimens to maintain their blood sugar so symptomatic hypoglycemia, so blood sugar is too low. Um, this is an acute emergency where a patient's blood glucose level drops and must be corrected swiftly. So again, a lot more dangerous and happens a lot faster. This can occur in patients who inject insulin or use oral medications. So you might see some test questions that ask about who is most at risk for a hypoglycemic crisis. Okay, so I'll give you a few examples. A patient who um, takes a dose of insulin and then forgets to eat or let's say they do eat but they vomit and throw their medicate and throw up their food okay um, that insulin is still in the bloodstream but their food never made it there so they're really at risk for hypoglycemia when insulin levels remain high Glucose is rapidly taken out of the blood, and if we don't have any glucose to replace it with, then the glucose level is going to continue to fall, and that's where we start to see these signs and symptoms. Now, if there's an insufficient amount to supply the brain, that's where you're going to start to see the symptoms of hypoglycemia. The mental status is going to decline. Now, everybody kind of has their own um, trigger level, let's say, for where they start to become symptomatic. So again, this is patient dependent on what's normal for them. The average area where we start providing treatment is when the blood sugar reaches around 60. But again, that could be different from person to person. If a person's blood sugar is normally high, then they might start experiencing these signs and symptoms a lot sooner than someone whose blood sugar is not normally high. Okay. So just to be clear, that can vary from person to person. So the patient may become really aggressive or display unusual behavior, and it's not uncommon for them not to remember this, okay? I have been to um, old grandmas who have completely cussed me up one side and down the other in their state of hypoglycemia, and as soon as their blood sugar comes back up, they have no idea what happened. They have no idea what they said. Okay, I have had patients with hypoglycemia who are so aggressive, who try to fight you and your crew, and they have no idea what they are doing. So don't hold it against the patient, but also maintain your situational uh, awareness and make sure that your scene is safe for yourself as well. Unconscious or permanent brain damage can quickly follow. So again, we want to make sure that the airway is managed, but we also want to make sure we're providing glucose as quickly as we can. At the EMT level, that's going to be with oral glucose. So the patient has got to be able to swallow for you to intervene here, and they've got to have a good understanding of what's happening, and you've got to be able to um, 
tell them what to do and provide that medication buccally. And we're going to follow that up with them eating something. So something of substance, usually carbohydrates like a peanut butter sandwich, uh, orange juice with sugar mixed in. All right. We want something that's going to keep that blood sugar up long term. Now, if the patient cannot follow your directions, they can't swallow, then we're going to need ALS um, to provide, again, intravenous dextrose. This does develop a lot more quickly than hypoglycemia. And some things that we're looking at there, again, altered mental status, cool, clammy skin, could be tachycardia. Um, the biggest thing is going to be generalized weakness. So the patient's probably going to feel these things coming on and maybe try to do something for themselves if they've, if they've got a good awareness of what's happening. Hypoglycemia can be quickly reversed by giving the patient glucose, and so we just kind of talked about that, the situations of where oral glucose is applicable and where it's not. Again, this chart is just one example. It doesn't necessarily mean um, this is the standard for every single patient. I have seen patients with a blood sugar of 30 who are still able to talk to me normally. They just don't feel the best in the world. I have seen patients who are completely unresponsive at 70. Um, so it really just depends on the patient what's normal for them and their own physical response. So looking at some scene size up and safety tips, of course, like I said, we want to make sure that we are being safe all the time. These patients who use insulin may carry syringes, so making sure that there's not any uncapped syringes, that could be an issue there. Be alert for clues, look for those uh, bracelets, look for things in their phone, look for medications in their purse, in their medicine cabinet, look for insulin in the refrigerator, things to clue you in that could be what's going on here. Use your standard precautions, question any bystanders on the events leading up to your arrival, considering that they may have some type of trauma going on as well. Maybe this low blood sugar or high blood sugar caused them to wreck their vehicle or fall in their kitchen or, you know, any number of things. So looking for trauma as well. We're going to form our general impression. We're going to look for airway and breathing, trying to determine is the patient breathing adequately, and if not, do we need to intervene? Do we need to administer oxygen? Do we need to help ventilate the patient, depending on how severe this is? Hyperglycemic patients may have Kuzma respirations and a very sweet and fruity odor to the breath. So remember, during our patient assessment, we talked about that's one of the things that we're looking at during our full body hands-on assessment is that sweet and fruity odor to the breath. And so that's definitely something thing to consider um, and it's going to be one of those hallmark signs of really severe hyperglycemia, especially DKA. Hypoglycemic patients will have normal or shallow to rapid respirations just depending on how severe it is. If there is any respiratory distress, no matter the blood sugar, we want to intervene and manage it. Usually with the skin, with hyperglycemia, we're talking about dry, warm skin. With hypoglycemia, moist, pale, cool, clammy skin. So we can also have a rapid and weak pulse with hypoglycemia. Um, again, with we have that weak, thready pulse. We should That should clue us in in addition to that uh, cool, clammy skin. But we want to check the blood sugar and just find out what is it. When we're making our transport decision, this is a big deal as well, especially for diabetics, because a lot of diabetics, if they're known diabetics, uh, when we raise that blood sugar, they don't want to go to the hospital after that. And so then we've got to kind of look at our own policies and procedures within our county where we're working and determine is this a patient that I can allow to refuse transport after I've provided treatment? What does my medical director deem as um, okay? And so I'll just use Johnston County for example. And again, that's that's not everywhere. That's Johnston County. But for here, our policy with Dr. Hartman is if the patient is not going to be left alone, so they have a family member or a friend that's going to stay there with them, um, and their blood sugar is over 80, then they have the right to refuse. But other things that we want to take into consideration are, is are they taking long-acting insulins? Are they taking oral medications that can continue to decrease the blood sugar? And we definitely, like I said, don't want to leave them alone. So we're looking at the whole big picture here before allowing them to refuse um, that treatment and transport. If you have any question about that, of course, you want to call your medical control and just ask them, does this patient need to, to stay here? Can they refuse? So on and so forth, if there's ever any question. 
looking at history taking, we want to ask those questions about, you know, patient history, uh, their responsiveness, family bystanders, have they eaten, have they taken insulin? Um, those things are really a big deal to know what was their last meal that they had, what was it, um, have they been compliant with their medications, if they took insulin, how much did they take, and then do they really have the cognitive ability to be able to give themselves insulin? It, it, I've recently, just a few months ago, had a patient who, um, you know, when we got to him, his blood sugar was 14 and the patient was fighting us. Uh, but his wife was able to tell us that he did take his own insulin, but that he did it himself and she doesn't know what his blood sugar was. But when we were able to wake the patient up after giving him some IV dextrose, he told us that his blood sugar was 48 prior to taking his insulin and he took 90 units of insulin, which is a huge amount. Okay. So his blood sugar was already low at 48, but he just did what his doctor told him because the doctor didn't say if it's a certain amount, don't take your insulin. He just said at this time of day, every day, give yourself this insulin. And so he gave himself this huge dose of insulin and almost killed himself. Okay. So we really want to make sure that the patient has a good understanding of how to use their medications as well. And that's another good role for our community paramedic programs when they're following up with patients so that they are able to kind of gauge the, and monitor these things. So again, we're also going to ask these additional sample history questions. Do you take insulin? Do you take uh, medication orally to lower your blood sugar? Do you have an insulin pump? Um, have you taken your usual insulin dose or your medications by mouth? Have you eaten normally today? Have you had any illness, unusual amount of activity, or stress? Because all of those things can impact the blood sugar more than you would believe. Um, usually any type of sickness, whether it's nausea and vomiting, whether it is um, uh, even an infection in the body, even a respiratory infection or an, an unusual amount of stress, these can all cause the blood sugar to go up more than you would think. So all really important questions to ask. Looking at the physical exam, we're going to assess any unresponsive patient from head to toe using that full body trauma assessment. If we suspect a diabetic related problem, we're going to focus on the mental status, the ability to swallow and protect their airway before we're giving any type of oral glucose if the blood sugar is low. Again, we're going to look at vital signs using a glucometer to determine if the patient's blood sugar is high or low. And we can also look at these physical signs, which we've already kind of talked about, um, to determine and kind of go hand in hand with that hypo or hyperglycemia as we're de uh, determining our treatment. We want to make sure that our glucometer is in good working order, that the battery is not dead, that it's calibrated um, usually to capillary blood and that it is working uh, properly. If the blood sugar is too low, and that's going to be determined on the manufacturer recommendations of the glucometer, but usually under... Um, I've seen some that will read low when it's under 30. I've seen some that will read all the way down to about 12 or 13. That's about the lowest I've ever seen one go. But down to a certain point, it may start to read low. Just literally say LO on the uh, glucometer. And so that's how you would document it in your chart. But obviously, you know the patient needs treatment. Same thing if it's too high. Some will read up to around 300. Some will read up to 500. But anything more than that, usually it will say HI, just high on the glucometer and again letting you know that the patient definitely is hyperglycemic and in need of treatment. Again, with our uh, interventions, as depending on what's going on, if it's hypoglycemia, if we're administering uh, oral glucose to the patient who can swallow and follow your commands, and then are we giving them something to eat from their house? Um, usually, if they're a known diabetic and they've been through this before, they'll have something there, some uh, quick and easy to eat like snack cakes or pieces of candy, but we want to make sure it's not hard candy, that they're not going to choke on it, juice with sugar in it, um, something that we can provide to them. Cake icing is a really good alternative that patients might, you know, have in their home uh, in addition to the oral glucose as well. If they are not able to do those things, then we definitely need ALS and we might need to transport. This is just giving you kind of a rundown. If the patient does need ALS, what are they going to do for them? That could be IV or intravenous glucose. It could be an intramuscular injection of glucagon. It could be, um, you know, any number of things, just depending on what the protocol is. So we just want to make sure that we get that ALS provider there. And if there's ever any question, that we are contacting medical control.
If for some reason you're unable to test for a blood glucose value, like because your glucometer dies and you don't have the availability to get a second one or to call an additional unit or supervisor there to get their glucometer, um, we do want to just go ahead and uh, uh, assist the patient with whatever we can as far as airway management, oxygen management, and transport to the uh, nearest facility and allow them to check the blood sugar there. And then we just want to make sure that we are documenting all of that thoroughly. If the patient does refuse transport, like we talked about previously, after treatment for their low blood sugar, know what your protocols are. Do you have to have it up to a certain level? Do you need specific authorization to allow the patient to refuse? And then uh, fill out the refusal form if you're going to and document all of that in your report, getting the appropriate um, signatures as well from the patient, from the bystanders or witnesses. And then let's take a look at this. This is oral glucose, and these are just a few examples. Remember, it can come in a tablet. Most places will carry this rapidly dissolving gel, which we would administer in the buccal route between the cheek and the gum. The patient cannot have uh, any type of issues with swallowing or following commands, and we want to make sure that we're following our protocol, that we are reassessing frequently, and then again, if our protocol deems necessary, that we're providing transport. 